By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I am playing a game of EDH old school commander one versus one. So it's not multiplayer. And as you can see, we are playing Nicol Bolas versus Nicol Bolas. So we both have Nicol Bolas as our commander and we are going to battle it out here. It is going to be very exciting. I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, people have told me that you can actually not do it with the same commander. I have no idea. Probably true, but I just really thought this was a cool idea. I'm playing against Dion. He is one of my channel members and also Magic Friends. And he contacted me and he said, you know, it would be really cool. I've got a really sweet commander deck and uh, old school and let's play. It's good to know, by the way, that we are playing according to the Swedish rules and we are not playing with uh, Fallen Empires. So we're only playing with 93, 94. I'm saying Swedish, but um, you are allowed to use reprints because I'm playing with tons of revised. Talking about what I'm playing with, I have deck pictures of both of these decks. So um, I'm about to start with the deck tech. Now, if you want to go straight to the games, you can check out the description below. There you will find a timestamp. Click on the timestamp and that will take you straight to game one. Now, here we are going to start with the deck techs. And um, you know what? Let's start with my deck. Let's take a look at my Nicole Bolas EDH Commander deck. And here we see my deck and my commander, just like Dion's, is Nicol Bolas. And uh, for the people that don't know, it's an Elder Dragon 7-7 flyer and the colors that it represents are blue, black and red. So that means that my commander deck only consists out of cards that are represented in those colors. Now, the way I've built this deck up, I decided I want all my white bordered cards to be revised. So all my white bordered lands and all the other white bordered cards, they're all revised. I decided I don't want to include unlimited or fourth edition or chronicles purely because the look of the deck and because of my connection with revised revised is my alpha so I'm, i really have a connect strong connection with that set um so that's kind of the nutty side of me building a deck and you know i'm, I'm sure a lot of magic players recognize that you have your kind of your own logic to make decisions and it's not always based on i want to play with the, with the strongest cards actually it rarely is based on that um, so, uh, this is my Bolas deck. One card I just want to point out real quickly is Sol Canard, the Swamp King. I think he's a wonderful, beautiful, big, beefy creature. And I think he's, he's second in command after Nicole. Uh, one red, one black, one blue. So the same colors as Bolas and two to cast. It's a uh, five, five for five, which is fantastic and old school. It's got Swamp Walk and there's a really cool ability, which is quite important here. And that's Sol Canard's controller gains one life each time a black spell is being cast. And that might seem insignificant, but remember I'm playing with black, Dion is playing with black. And I mean, I'm just gaining life here. So this could be quite interesting. Another thing I wanted to point out is while I was building this deck, I thought, okay, what are some of the people and creatures that would like to work with Nicol Bolas? And I thought, well, if you're a big bat leviathan or a big bat, you know, rock hydra, shivan dragon, um, he is the most powerful dragon, right? So he's gonna, gonna get service from the most powerful creatures and golems around, you know, we've also have a Colossus of Sardia in this deck. So I thought that would be really sweet to, to put in the deck. And at the same time, I wanted to kind of create, um, I also wanted to put powerful humans in here you know powerful sorcerer so of course i've got protocol sorcerer in here but also royal assassin i mean that guy would definitely work with nico bolas definitely but also you know sorcerer's queen a sly and cunning queen that wants power and can manipulate creatures and can actually weaken them of course that's something that nico bolas would play nettling imp that card is nico bolas all over him you know but also a powerful and cunning uh, elemental like time elemental he would he would probably have that because uh, he's, he, if you look at the lore of Nicole, he's always has always been interested in magic more so than most other dragons. So that is definitely something that I wanted to kind of bring back in this deck, also with powerful artifacts and creatures with powerful abilities. Um, maybe it, maybe it's a good idea if I kind of show you a few of the card combinations that I've put in this deck. So one of them is this one. Icy Manipulator and Barrel's Cage. It's one that I play more often with in other commander decks as well. It's just really sweet. Icy Manipulator being an extremely powerful card, of course, because it's so diverse. Four to cast, one, you can tap target land. 
uh, you can tap a creature, you can tap an artifact. In this case, I want to tap a creature with it and I want to use Barrel's Cage. Barrel's Cage is not so well known. It's a card from the dark, also an artifact for to cast. It's a mono artifact, meaning that you can, or sorry, a poly artifact, meaning that you can use it multiple times so you don't have to tap it. Um, and what it does, you pay three and then target creature does not untap during the untap phase. And you can do that multiple times, like I said. So that is quite interesting. I can start tapping down the entire army and keep it tapped of my opponent. Now, another sweet combo here is a combo with Apprentice Wizard. It's just Apprentice Wizard is such a nice guy. Two blue to cast, uh, two blue and one to cast. It's an 0 one creature, one blue and tap, and you get three colorless mana. And I think that this works really well with Basil Monolith, for example, but also with other cards like GM Day Tome. But I've just taken the Basil Monolith as an, except, uh, an example because it's three to cast, you tap it for three, and you need to untap it for three. So three, 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 right? And hey, Apprentice Wizard, one blue, it gives you three. So think of a scenario where on end step of my opponent, my Bezel Monolith is tapped, my Apprentice Wizard is untapped. I can pay one blue, untap my Bezel Monolith, then it's my turn, I untap my Wizard. And then for one blue mana, I have six mana to my disposal. And then I'm gonna cast a Rock Hydra. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is the dream. Um, let's take a look at another one, shall we? Uh, let's have a look here. What do we have? Oh yeah, of course, we've got this uh, interesting uh, quartet, I guess. Is that an English word? Quartet? In, in Dutch we say quartet. Anyway, it means four, four people that match really well. So we've got Sengir Vampire, Sorcerer's Queen, Royal Assassin, Natalie Imp. So this is just a great combination. So Netling Imp, I can tap and I can force my opponent to attack with a creature. So this can be a small creature. That creature has to attack. The creature is going to tap. Then I can either kill it with my Royal Assassin or I can eat it with my Sengir Vampire if the creature is small enough. And if the creature is too big, I can actually make it smaller with my Sorcerer's Queen, turning it into an O2, eating it with the Sengir Vampire, and then getting a nice plus one, plus one counter on my four, four Flying Vampire. So that is definitely something that uh, I'm hoping to pull off in this deck. Now, another thing that this deck has are a lot of well, a lot, all the pingers that I have in old school. So it's got a desert, it's got Rod of Rune, it's got a pirate ship, it's got my beautiful protocol sorcerer altar of Tim the Enchanter. Um, so I have those. And then I want to combine that with Sorcerer's Queen. Sorcerer's Queen makes target creature an O2. And then I can ping it down with my protocol sorcerer and my pirate ship or, you know, Rod of Ruin. You get the idea. So let's take a look. What else do we have in this deck? Ah, yes, I'm playing with Hell's Caretaker. That is, I mean, such a sweet card. Hell's Caretaker, not as well known as a lot of other old school cards. It's uh, one black and three to cast a summon Hell's Caretaker. It's a one one. And during your upkeep, you can tap it. You can sacrifice a creature and take a creature from your graveyard and put it directly into play. So that is the cool thing about this. And you can treat it just as though it were just summoned. So it comes untapped into play. It doesn't have haste. You cannot attack with it yet because treat it as it just summoned. But still, how incredible is this? And then I can combine that with the Hive. The Hive is an artifact, five in tap, and you can create a 1-1 one, one flying wasp token. So I can sack my wasp token to get a big beefy creature back or get like one of those smaller powerful creatures back like Sorcerer's Queen, Royal Assassin, whatever. So there are tons of options in my deck. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, another more kind of innocent combo, also kind of a combo with Hell's Caretaker, I guess, is the Jalem Tome and the Nether Shadow. So Nether Shadow, two black to cast, a 1-1. One, one, when I saw this creature, I thought, okay, this is a creature who would definitely work with Nicol Bolas, right? This is also one of those evil, slimy, conniving creatures. It's a 1-1, one, one, and the ability of this creature is quite unique. Let's, let's take a look at this. If Shadow is in a graveyard with any combination of cards above it that includes at least three creatures, it can be returned to play during your upkeep. Shadow can attack on the same turn it was summoned or returned to play. So it's quite interesting. So it's got haste, which is super unique for old school. Um, and it comes back. So when there are three creatures on top, it comes back. So my idea here is I use my Jalem Tome to draw a card, I have to discard a card. If I have my Nether Shadow, I'm just gonna put that in the bin first and then we'll take it from there. Of course, Jalem Tome also works very well with Hell's Caretaker. If I'm early game, I can put like a huge creature, like a Sheevan Dragon in the bin, and then I can cast my Hell's Caretaker, maybe even sack the Hell's Caretaker to itself, get Sheevan into play. So that's that's another combination. And then of course we have the Nevenrose disc. So I'm playing with some Regeneration, the Satch Troll, the Drudge Skeleton. I'm also playing with Rook Ak, O3 from Arabian Nights, 
Um, one red and three, and when it dies at the end of your turn, you get a four, four flying creature back. So that is pretty cool. And of course that works great with Neverneural's Disc. Blow everything up and at the end of turn, I have a four, four flying creature. My opponent has nothing. Okay, so these are some of the combos. Um, oh, actually I have some, I just wanted to share this with you because it's kind of insane. Uh, I've got Jander's Settleback, which I think it's not, it's, it's actually pretty useful, especially in Commander, I think. Let me know what you think of this card in a Commander setting. It's two to cast. You can pay three and tap it to untap target creature. So that means, you know, um, for a Leviathan, I would have to sacrifice islands to untap it, right? Well, with Jander Saddleback, all I have to do is pay two mana and I can untap it. The same thing goes for Colossus of Sardia. Usually I have to pay nine to untap it. Jander Saddleback, pay two and untap it. Besides the fact that Jander Saddleback is very useful for these two specific creatures, I think in general, again, it's great with the Royal um, it could be great in the situation with Hell's Caretaker if I want to sacrifice two creatures during my upkeep. I mean, who knows? Maybe I have some kind of weird reason for that. Maybe I have multiple tokens and a lot of strong creatures in the bin. There could be an option. And basically what Gender Saddleback does as well, it gives all your creatures vigilance, which could be really useful. So for two, well, I guess not all my creatures because you can only tap it on one. Uh, but, uh, and I'm sorry, the activation cost is three, by the way. Casting cost is two, three and tap. So unfortunately not two and tap. But still, for three mana, I can give target creature that I own basically Vigilance, which is quite nice. Um, and then I want to show you, I think this is, yeah, this is going to be the last little combo I'm going to share with my deck, just because it's ridiculous. I'm playing with Enchantment Alteration, because I figured out my opponent is probably going to play with blue, so he has Control Magic, I have Control Magic. And what Enchantment Alteration does, it's uh, one blue to cast an instant from Legends and it says switch target enchantment from one creature to another or from one land to another. Now I don't play with Phantasmal Terrain or any other enchant lands, but who knows, maybe my opponent does. Um, the controller of the enchantment does not change. New targets of the enchantment must be valid or the spell has no effect. Treat this as if the enchantment had, has not been cast on the, um, sorry, as if the enchantment had just been cast on the new target. So. The cool thing is here, because of enchantment alteration, I can just play out my control magic early game and think, you know what? I'm gonna draw into my enchantment alteration. I can always switch it later if a better, bigger creature comes in the game. Like for example, Nico Bolas, the, the commander in, in both of our decks. Of course, this is not a rock solid strategy because we're playing with 100 cards, I guess a 99 cards because the commander is in the command zone and only one of them is the enchantment alteration, but still, I kind of like the idea of having this in my deck and I just want to do something with it. It's such a cool and and, and weird old school card. Anyway, um, this is my deck. I'm really looking forward to play this against Dion's deck because I know it's completely black bordered. Talking about that, let's take a look at the deck of my opponent, Dion. And here we see the deck of Dion and oh, oh my. It is just beautiful, it's gorgeous, it's completely black bordered. Um, he's got the same commander as me, like I uh, mentioned before, Nico Bola, so that means he's also playing with blue, red, and black in his deck. And he's not only playing with the Soul Canar as his second in command, no, he's got more commanders. He's playing with Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn, quite an interesting card, uh, provocative artwork, I must say. It is one red, two black, and one blue to cast for a 3-5 creature. Yes, Gwendolyn is 3-5 which is huge, you know, especially when you look at the art. Why is she 3-5? Probably because she's a sorceress or a sorceress or whatever. Anyway, what she does is quite strong as well. So for four mana, you've got a 3-5, which is a pretty good deal, especially in old school. And then when you tap her, target player discards one card from his or her hand at random. So at random, guys, so it's not like a disrupting scepter. This is better and you don't have to pay any mana for it at random. How? Freaking annoying is this card going to be against me. So I definitely want to get rid of Gwendolyn as soon as she comes into play. Another, the other one uh, the in command is Tetsuo Umezawa. And again, very strong card. Three to cast as for three, three. So one black, one blue, one red for a three, three. So that's really strong and old school. And then you can pl uh, pay a red, two black and a blue and tap it and destroy target tap creature. So it's kind of like a royal, but here it comes or target blocking creature. So it's actually better. 
And another downside, Tetsuo may not be a target of an enchant creature spell, so I cannot play a control magic on Tetsuo. So this is, yeah, man, uh, this is a strong deck. So he's got these legends um, that are very strong, but look at the rest of the deck. He's got a guardian beast, and a guardian beast he can com uh, combine with a chaos orb, and that means he can just endlessly flip his chaos orb and kill my entire battlefield, because guardian beast is a creature um, from the Arabian Nights, one black and three to cast for a two four. And what it says is uh, creature uh, artifacts cannot be destroyed. So you flip your Chaos Orb, right? And usually after the flip, it's destroyed. But that doesn't happen because of Guardian Beast. So you can flip endlessly. It does, it does return tapped after the flip. So you have to wait a turn before it untaps. That's the only kind of plus for me when he gets this combo on the board. But when he has this on the board, I have to kill the Guardian Beast as soon as possible. That's definitely something I have to do. I just think this whole deck looks very, very scary. Um, he's also playing with all the blue power cards, actually all the power cards. I believe the whole power nine is, um, oh no, of course he doesn't have the off color Moxen, so it's not the whole power nine, but look at that. Mox Ruby, Mox Jet, Mox Sapphire, Black Lotus, Ancestral Recall, Time Walk, Time Twister. I mean, geez, this is, <laughs> this is huge. But actually a card that I am more looking at than these power cards is, um, and this may sound a bit weird, but it, or those legends that I just discussed, I think they're more risky. Also a card like Mirror Universe uh, can really be tricky. Mirror Universe, a card from Legend 6 to cast, uh, and when it comes into play, you can tap it and you can switch uh, the lives so of you and your opponent. Now, luckily you cannot activate it the turn it comes into play. So at least that's something. So I have a whole turn to respond to the Mirror Universe and deal with the Mirror Universe. But um, yeah, I think Mirror Universe is definitely uh, a card that I have to that I have to keep in mind uh, when playing against the deck. Also Sword of the Ages, another card that uh, you cannot use when it comes into play. I believe it comes into play tapped. Um, it's also six to cast. And when it's then Dion's turn again, he can tap and sacrifice the sword and he can kill an X amount of creatures and those creatures deal damage to me or any target actually equal to their power. So it's one of those cards that he can use to kind of kill me on the spot. So yeah, it's a very scary deck. When I look at this deck, I mean, there are just so many good cards in here that, you know, I can talk about this endlessly. I can see so many, you know, possible combo combinations. Um, I really like the fact that he's also playing with Steel Artifact, by the way, just like me. So maybe we're going to steal a lot of stuff with those Steel Artifacts. That's going to be quite interesting. So this is the deck of Dion. Beautiful, gorgeous, amazing deck. Well done, Dion. Loving the white sleeves. I saw the cards from close by. They're also in excellent condition. Super, super jealous. But um, let's go to the games and let's see how this is going to turn out. So let's go to game one. Game number one is about to start. And here you can see both of our life totals. My opponent, Dion, is playing with the white sleeves. I am playing with the black sleeves. And we're drawing our first seven. Let's take a look here. And as you can see, I'm filming this from a bird's eye perspective. And I'm on the play here, starting with a basic swamp. Let's see what Dion's gonna do here. Starting off with a beautiful island. Passing turn, there is a desert on my part. Look at that flower stone, so I'm ramping right into it. That's pretty good. Actually, after this game, I decided to add some extra lands. I'm now playing with 37 lands in this deck. I was playing with 35, which is not enough, I can tell you. There's a second island here from Dion tapping both. Wow, Chaos Orb. So starting off strong here, but I'm ramping. Let's see what I can do in turn number three, playing an underground sea, tapping three here. And there's a Basil Monolith. So that means, okay, tapping it for four instantly. And there's a Nevenerals Disc. So I'm really challenging Dion here in a way to activate his orb on my disc. On the other hand, there's no need for him to do that now because if I would blow up the disc, I'm trading it anyway for the Chaos Orb and I'm also taking care of both of my mana rocks, the Basalt Monolith and the Felwer Stone. So that wouldn't make much sense. But what an interesting board state already. And turn number three here for Dion, staring down at many permanents on my side of the board. What is he going to do here? Playing a basic swamp. And it 
looks like he's just passing turn, or is he still in the tank? We're having a little discussion here, it seems. Looking at his hand again. Maybe he's thinking about using his orb or destroying one of my artifacts. Playing a Mox Ruby. That's interesting. Means he has four, four mana at his disposal. Oh, Guardian Beast. I talked about this in the deck text. <laughs> oh, this is such a killer combination here. Guardian Beast Chaos Orb. He's also pointing it out. And I mean, that probably means I have to trigger my Nevenerals disc. But that does mean that if I trigger my disc, all I really do is kill his Guardian Beast because the Guardian Beast protects his other artifacts from being destroyed and I lose both of my mana rocks. So it's not an ideal scenario for me. And now it's kind of my turn to be in the tank here to really think about, you know, what is a smart thing to do. And we're discussing, of course, pointing out the combo knowing that I have to do something, but I'm just passing turn here, so I guess I have something up my sleeve. I wonder what it is, though. We'll just have to see, because chances are pretty big here that Dion's going to activate his Chaos Orb. Why wouldn't he with that Guardian Beast? And that's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to activate his Chaos Orb, and now I have time to respond. So before the flip, I need to respond. What can I do? Maybe I have a boomerang in hand. I'm gonna boomerang the guardian beast. That could be an option. I must have something or else I would have activated the disc in the previous turn. A lot of thinking going on. Remember, I have fast forwarded this game and still it's going pretty slow. So there's a lot of thinking. There is the boomerang on the guardian beast. And if he doesn't counter this, then at least his Chaos Orb is gone here after the flip. So he's now going to flip. And he's going to flip on my Nevenerals disc. So we're basically trading a disc for an orb. And I've also lost, of course, my Boomerang. So this is a pretty good deal for Dion here. If he has another land, because he didn't have his land drop yet, he can actually play out his Guardian Beast again if he wants to. Wow, of course, Black Lotus, why not? Cracking the Lotus here. Are we going to see a huge creature? Sheevan Dragon? Oh, man, this is uh, this is bad news for me here. Let's see what I can do against the Sheevan. Tapping three, and there's a, a Sorcerer's Queen. That's actually pretty nice. At least uh, I have something. I'm going to take a hit from the Sheevan. There's not much I can do about that, but then after that, at least I can use my Sorcerer's Queen to make it an O2. And uh, unless, of course, Dion has something against the Sorcerer's Queen. First, he's going to attack, makes sense, and use his Mox Ruby to make it a 6-5 flyer. So I'm going down to 34, and there is the Guardian Beast again. And I'm, I'm low on lands, by the way. Okay, I'm finding another Swamp. That's good news for me here, because I missed a land drop earlier. Tapping four. What am I going to play for four? Okay, there's a Rod of Ruin. And look at this. And if, if you pay close attention, you can see what I can do now. I don't have enough mana, unfortunately, to activate my Rod of Ruin. But if I would have, then potentially, if Dion attacks with Yashivan, I can make it an O2 of Sorcerer's Queen, give it a damage with Desert and a damage with Rod of Ruin. But I don't have enough mana to activate the Rod of Ruin right now. But it is a pretty cool idea. It's just not going to work this turn. Let's first see what Dion's going to do. Having a lot of mana to his disposal. Playing a Mishra's Factory. Interesting here to note is that Guardian Beast's protection of artifacts goes away when it is tapped. So it needs to remain untapped to protect the artifacts. And that's probably why Dion is not attacking with the Guardian Beast and also not attacking with the Sheevan because of the Sorcerer's Queen, of course. There's another land for me, counting my mana here. And it looks like I'm just passing turn, only two in hand. Maybe I want to untap my Bezel Monolith on his end step.
But the advantage here definitely is for, for Dion, just having more options. Is he doing here something on my end step? He has tapped three lands here. What is he going to do? Let's see. Oh, a psionic blast. Oh, man, this is bad news. Yeah, but I'm doing this end step, so now he's going to take his turn. That means that I don't have a Sorcerer's Queen to protect myself. And I have to say, this entire first game, I've been under pressure. Unable to play any big threats myself. Two cards in hand here. I do have a lot of mana, so at least that's something. But, I mean, he's going to swing in with his Shiva, and I think probably going to deal 7 damage. Maybe going to attack with his Factory too, then he can deal 9. Or who knows, maybe he's even going to play a bigger threat. He has 247. It's not enough yet to cast a Bolas. So we're not going to see that yet. There's a Felwer Stone of his own. Going to attack. Interesting using the Red Mana to activate his factory. That probably means that he has a Desert in, or a um, Counterspell in hand. Look at this. I can use my uh, Rod of Ruin Desert combination to kill the factory. Yeah. Yeah, the young. Woohoo! I'm happy. Of course, taking a ton and ton of damage, going down to 25. But hey, man, I've used my desert rod of ruin combination. What more can you want in life? Playing an island here. But I need something against that chief. And control magic will be just so nice right now. I mean, playing with terrors. I'm playing just with a lot of solutions here to this big bad monster. But I have to draw into it, of course. There's a barrel's cage. Actually, I can use the barrel's cage. This is really good news. Remember, Barrel's Cage, I can pay three and then target creature doesn't untap during its next untap step. So that means I can now use Barrel's Cage to keep the Sheevan Dragon tapped. And Dion is reading the card here. And because it's a Poli Artifact, I don't have to tap it to activate it. So I can use it multiple times, which is not relevant right now. But you can see Dion putting the dice there on the Sheevan to indicate that it doesn't untap and then takes it off during the upkeep. So next turn is going to untap unless I use the barrel's cage again. And I'm kind of forced to because I don't want to die. And there we see... Oh, of course, it's a jam day tome. There's a bit of reflection on the card. So I was doubting, but mm, this is more bad news for me, actually. The tome is going to give him card advantage. And I think I saw a disintegrate there in Dion's hand as well. Another powerful card if I draw into a strong creature. Looking at my cards here, looks like I have to pay three again. Activate Barrel's Cage. Using Underground C, playing a Raise Dead on Sorcerer's Queen. And probably going to pass turn because he can't cast it yet. And um, yeah, the Shiva remains tapped. But of course, the problem for me now is that Dion has a Jam Day Tome. And, you know, that means card advantage for him. And of course, he has a Disintegrate in hand that I don't know the existence of. So I'm thinking I'm going to play the Sorcerer's Queen. And then I can deal with the Shivan, And I don't have to pay three every turn for my Barrel's Cage. And I have some more breathing space. But of course, I don't know that he has that Disintegrate that he can use instantly. Well, not instantly because it's a sorcery, but you know what I mean. He can use it straight away as soon as it's his turn on my on my Sorcerer's Queen. And it's only going to send him back two mana, so he still has plenty of mana to draw extra cards with, with his Jam Day Tome. And cannot quite see what that blue card is. Okay, it's just an island playing out the basic island. Probably going to pass turn here. I'm sure he doesn't want to take the risk of attacking with his Guardian Beast. Because remember, when he attacks with the Guardian Beast, he no longer has protection. Oh, look at this. Oh, he's going to play Nicol Bolas. He's got enough mana. Oh, man. Oh, of course, I didn't think about that at all. He's got enough land to do that now. How much land do I actually have? I'm going to untap my Basalt Monolith. So that means I've got a lot of lands. Can I play my Nicol Bolas? Playing an island first. I think I can actually. I can play up my Nicol Bolas. That is interesting. Maybe that's a better move than playing out the Sorcerer's Queen. I think that's what I'm going to do. Playing out Nicol Bolas here as well. So it's Bolas against Bolas. And I think I'm pointing out the glare here. So he's moving his cards, which is quite nice. And wow. 
Okay, so at least the nickel is kind of keeping me alive here because it doesn't look... It doesn't look like it's a good option for Dion to attack. And because he has to pay the upkeep cost to keep Bolas around, he cannot play his Disintegrate or he can... Yeah. He doesn't have enough mana to cast a Disintegrate that's big enough to kill my Nicol Bolas. But he, of course, I mean, it's still looking really, really good for Dion because of that jam they told him. He still has four lands, gets to draw a card. And now he, if he wants to, he can just pass turn, end step, use his jam day tome. And as you could see, I used my uh, barrel's cage on his Sheevan dragon. Possibly wanting to attack him because for me, a standstill is just not that good because of that jam day tome. Paying three, of course, for Nicol Bolas. Going to draw my card here for turn. I mean, I'm still behind. If I could just get a Steel Artifact, steal his book, that would be really nice. First, I'm going to attack. So I'm offering him to trade here. And he's going to take it. And of course, placing a die on both of the boluses, indicating that they've gone back to their command zones for the first time. And then you've got to pay two extra to cast. And look at this. I'm playing very mana efficiently. Casting that Sorcerer's Queen and being able to activate the Barrel's Cage for the Sheevan Dragon. And of course, he's going to draw a card at end step. It's actually the first card he's drawn so far from it, so it's not too bad for me yet. And now he's untapping all his lands, untapping his book, not untapping his Sheevan. I have to say, I really like the Barrel's Cage. Let me know in the comments below if you've played with this card before. And if so, in what format you played it. There is a swamp here on the board. And I'm just going to rearrange my, my lands here. I mean, just have to wait anyway. And even though I've got tons of land, it's still a little bit of a struggle for me. And I think... The same thing counts for my opponent, Dion, of course, that wants to try to keep four uh, mana available for his Jam Day Tome. Look at this beautiful Vesuvian Doubleganger, that Quentin Hoover art. Absolutely stunning. One of the most beautiful cards in old school magic. And in this case, also a very good card. Playing the Vesuvian, copying his Sheevan Dragon. So I'm playing against two Sheevan Dragons right now. That is not ideal. And I do think I see a Serendip Efreet in his hand. And he has enough land to play that one out as well. The question is, does he want to? He's playing a Disintegrate of one. And can't I use the Sorcerer's Queen to make it an O2 herself, by the way? Is that a way that I could have... Could I have done that to protect it? I'm not sure, actually. Maybe it says other creature or opponent's creature. Let's have a look. It says make another creature O2 until end of turn. Treat this exactly as if the numbers are 0 and 2. Anyway, it says other creature. So I couldn't have done that. That would have been a nice trick to kind of protect my Sorcerer's Queen from the Disintegrate. But that doesn't work. Unfortunately for me, drawing, finding another mountain. And what can I do now? Yeah, sorting my lands kind of uh, to make it look impressive. But the truth is... I have nothing. I can use my Barrel's Cage at least. That's, that's, I mean, my Barrel's Cage is, is really what's keeping me alive here in Game 1. I would have been literally toast because of the Sheevan Dragonfire, if not for the Barrel's Cage. And now um, we are going to see Dion probably swing in here with his Vesuvian Doubleganger. Looking at his hand, I think I see a blue Elemental Blast there. And he still has... Oh, no, there are two creatures. A Surrender, a Freed, and a Tetravis. Why not just play out at least one of those? Let's see, how many land does he have? Two, five, seven, nine lands. I would probably play out the Surrender, keep enough land open to draw an extra card with the Jam Day Tome. First, he's going to attack me here with his Vesuvian Sheevan Dragon. That means I'm going to drop to 20 if he's not going to pump it. And then if I'm smart, I can actually use my Barrel's Cage and Step 
but I'm not doing that. So this is something that you can do for barrel skate. It just says during the next untap step of the, of the controller, the creature is not going to untap. So what I can do here potentially is on his end step, I can activate my barrel skate twice for six mana. And that means both of his dragons are not going to untap. Looks like he's going to play his Surrender Afrit here. So 3-4 Flyer from Arabian Nights. One damage during the upkeep. Very strong card. Not as impressive next to the Sheevans. And it looks like I am using my Barrel's Cage at, on end step. Okay, good for me. The thing is, I don't play with Barrel's Cage that often. So it's, it's very easy to forget these little tricks. But I'm using my Barrel's Cage, and, and Barrel's Cage is really what's keeping me alive here, because I'm just not drawing into any big creatures, I'm not drawing into any creature destruction. Tapping a lot here, and Nico Bolas is joining the party again. That is good news, but my, oh no, my opponent doesn't have a solution, doesn't have the blue Elemental Blast, that was actually the Surrender of Freed. It does mean that I don't have any mana to use my Barrel's Cage. Then again, I used it on end step. So all my land sources stepped except for the one lonely Felwer Stone. And Dion then taking a damage from the Surrender, going to 37. I think this entire game he's been ahead. But then again, I'm not dead, so who knows? Maybe I'll draw into... Something powerful. Paying three. Oh, there's a Tetsuo. Remember, Tetsuo, card from Legends. And you can pay, I believe, two black, a red, and a blue. And you can tap it. And it can destroy target blocking creature or tapped creature. So he can attack now. And if I block it, he can actually destroy my Nicol Bolas. Well, not now, because it still has summoning sickness. But this is, this is really difficult what to do in this uh, situation. And he just keeps playing out good cards. I think that's kind of the gist of this game one. Dion just playing out good cards and I'm playing out, I don't know, mediocre stuff. There we see a Candelabra. Could in a way be useful because Candelabra says, you know, you can tap X and untap X, so he can use it to untap his red land one extra time to deal an extra damage, for example, which is pretty funny. But not super relevant right now in the game. Tapping two lands, playing a Drudge Skeleton. Well, that's not gonna <laughs> that's not gonna help me much. Because it looks like uh, the young is hardly playing with any ground forces in his deck. Or at least they're not on the table at the moment. Deciding not to attack with Nicol Bolas. Despite the fact that this is kind of the only open window I have. Because after, after that Tetsuo is going to lose Summoning Sickness. Then again if I attack with Bolas. He can use his Tetsuo next turn. And he can kill my dragon. And it has to go back to the command zone. So it's choosing between two shitty options. Really. And if you look... Right now at, uh, at my mana situation, you've seen I've kept enough mana open to tap both of his Sheev and Dragons. And that's exactly what I'm going to do now. I really have no option. It's doing that or die. So keeping his Sheevans at least tapped for this turn. And if Dion can just get rid of the Barrel's Cage, I mean, he can win this game very easily. He's probably going to swing in now with his Surrender Pafrit. Because I'm not going to block because of that Tetsuo. I am actually going to block. Just to save some damage here. Interesting choice. Maybe I also want to free up some, some mana. Because remember, I can now tap everything down with my Barrel's Cage. So actually this move makes sense. He's going to tap down his Tetsuo. Next turn with Barrel's Cage, I can keep his Tetsuo tapped. And I can keep his two dragon step. That's going to cost me nine mana. So I really need to get rid of Bolas just because I cannot pay the upkeep cost. And of course, the yeah, exactly. Bezel Monolith remains tapped, of course. I have to pay the three mana first to untap it. But because of Barrel's Cage, I just don't have enough land to do that. 
tapping three first, another three, another three. So I'm first gonna kind of use my barrels cage and see what options I have left open, which is not a lot, only two lands. Tapping it though, play, <laughs> playing a Nether Shadow, oh my goodness. I can actually attack first, well he's got his Guardian Beast to block so it doesn't make any sense. Oh man, this is so funny. Nether Shadow and Drudge Skeleton facing, look at that army. But they're all stuck in the Barrel's Cage. Except for the Surrender Pafrit. So Surrender Pafrit can swing in, you're going to drop down to 17 most likely. But that Hand of Dion is filled up pretty nicely. Four cards in hand, and I only have one card. And I think I see that card from Antiquities, where you can put creatures. Thomas's Coffin, that's the name. It's an artifact. You can cast and pay, what is it, three? And put a creature in Thomas's Coffin. Attacking here first with the Surrender, dropping down to 17. He's probably first going to draw another card or not. No, it looks like he's going to do something else. Tapping five here. What is he going to cast? Another creature? Oh, he's going to cast a recall. Yeah, so he's putting, actually putting away his Time Twister and his Mirror Universe. Getting back his Disintegrate and his Chaos Orb. Oh, man. Chaos Orb and Guardian Beast are back. I think this is kind of the nail in the coffin for me here, this recall. And... Um, I think this is it, because now he can use his Chaos Orb on my Barrel's Cage. And if my Barrel's Cage is gone, yeah, it's pretty much over. Oh, he misses the flip! Okay, okay, well, it, it doesn't matter because of the Guardian Beast. I mean, he can just give it another try next turn. Remember, Guardian Beast makes all his artifacts indestructible. Uh, it does come back tapped after... You've used the Chaos Orb, so he has to wait one entire turn, giving me potentially, you know, give, just giving me one more turn. Let's see, what am I going to do? I'm going to tap everything, it seems. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Tapping twelve mana, but what am I going to do with the twelve mana? Just tapping everything down that he has? I guess that's what I'm doing. Yeah. That's not really going to cut it for me. It's just going to buy me one more turn. He's probably going to flip now again. And he's going to flip on the barrel's cage. Probably really going to take his time this time. And yeah, that's a hit. Decent hit. Barrel's cage is gone. Remember, Chaos Orb remains because of the Guardian Beast. And this means death by Dragon next turn. Is there anything that can save me from this situation? I think not, because I'm not playing with white. With white, I would have had the option of a balance or the option of a wrath of God. I guess I can draw into, um, I forgot the name, it's an instant from the dark that deals six damage to everything. I guess I could draw into that, that would buy me some time. And playing another swamp. I think that that is actually my, my only out. Is that card called Pyrokinesis or Pyroclasm or... I forgot. Anyway, I'm attacking here with Nether Shadow and Drudge Skeleton. Tapping all my lands, playing a Howl from Beyond, trying to deal as much damage as I can. But of course he can use his artifact. Yeah, I'm pointing it out there and he can just pay one and say, okay, I'm just gonna take one damage. But hey, it's the idea that counts, right? And he's actually going to take the damage. Thank you, Dion, for doing that. That's nice. <laughs> he's like, no, nah, I'll take the damage. I'm tapping everything. And, um, yeah, this is it. I'm tapped out. I got nothing. Oh, man, this deck. Dion, really, really sweet deck. Beautiful to look at and also very strong. And I think that card's called Relic... No, it's not Relic Barrier. Um... The card that makes, when you take damage, you pay one and you only take one damage. Beautiful card. You don't see it that often. Douglas Schuler art. It's probably going to attack here. Yeah, going to attack with everything. That means 10, 13, 16 damage. And he can pump it up. Oh, he even has a disintegrate. Anyway, I am dead. 
on board. So game one goes to Dion. Congratulations for game one. And uh, yeah, let's go to game two. Why not? Let's have another game. Let's shuffle up. Game number two. So at least I am on the play. Yes. You know, that's something. I think I was on the play in game one. Anyway, it doesn't really matter with these sort of uh, matchups. Commander one versus one. Nico Bolas versus Nico Bolas. And it looks like I'm actually deciding that uh, Dion can go on the play here. So that I get that extra draw. There we see an island and a city of brass for Dion. Just a mountain on my side of the board here. Is he going to play something out? Is he going to keep his mana open? So many options. Just passing turn, it seems. Drawing a card here. Playing an island. Tapping two. Playing a flower stone again. And because of the city of brass, it can now make any color of land that I want. So that's pretty sweet. So again, I managed to ramp just like in game number one. But hopefully this time I can ramp into something useful or at least get some creature removal. Because that was a big problem for me. All I was doing in game one is basically answering the threats of the young. Well, all I, I mean, that took all of my energy, I should say. All of my resources. And playing out a Sedge Troll here. It's a 3-3 because of that Swamp. So that is a pretty good start, pretty aggressive start from Dion. Let's see if I have a weapon against it. And tapping three. <laughs> Sweet. So at least I'm playing a Protocol Sorcerer. As you can see, it's altered uh, to look like Tim the Enchanter from the Monty Python movie. The quest for the Holy Grail. There is the attack. From the set Troll, I'm dropping to 37. And I've also missed a land drop. So I'm just going to get slaughtered here in game number two. I hope not. Finding an island, tapping three. Come on, give me something useful. Basil Monolith. So again, I have the ramp train going. Am I going to cast something then? Or just going to keep my mana for next turn to cast something big? There's a mana drain on my Bezel Monolith. Ay, 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 that is not great. Because with the Bezel, I would have had seven lands next turn. Let's see, Dion here playing a mountain. Having that dice with the number three because of the mana drain. So he's got five lands now, casting a Sengir Vampire for five. Taking a damage from the city, attacking me, of course, with the throw, and I'm giving him one damage, picking him for one with my sorcerer. That's what I want to do. Okay, this is good news. Playing a control magic on the Sengir Vampire, but not finding any land, though. At least with the Sengir, I can block the Sedge Troll, and I can also start attacking him, of course. So I have some options, but I'm just... Very low on land still, so that's not ideal. Dion having five land, tapping all five, playing a Vesuvan Doubleganger, and cloning my Sengir Vampire. So two Sengirs here, tapping two, playing Copy Artifact over the Felwer Stone, and oh, this is nice. Ashes to ashes. That means both of his creatures are removed. I have to take five damage. And there's just that sweet Drew Tucker autograph that I'm showing to Dion here. Drew Tucker. Very nice artist. Really has his own style. You recognize a Drew Tucker card from anywhere. Out of 100 magic cards, I can point out the Drew Tuckers for you. Without much effort. And I see Manipulator. Aye, 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 aye. So now I also understand why I copied my Felwer Stone because I needed two black to cast the Ashes to Ashes. And tapping down, of course, my Sengir, at least taking a damage from his own City of Brass. So we're both on 29. What can I do here? Tapping three, playing Royal Assassin. 
At least I have some more power in this uh, in this second game. Finding some more threats, finding some more solutions. Let's see what Dion can do. I believe he also missed a land drop earlier. Looks like he's passing turn here, so I'm untapping, not doing anything, not even playing out a land. So that's good news for me. I forgot to ping him. Okay, well, it happens. I want to attack. Of course, he's going to tap in response. Choosing not to attack with my Royal. Playing a Jam Day Tome. Hopefully, he cannot counter it. Because that will give me the card advantage that I need to go and find more lands. Because I really just need more lands. That's what I, what I need. And maybe Dion needs it as well, since he's not playing out anything. Misses land drop last turn. It looks like, yeah, found a mountain. That means he's got six. Not doing anything. Pinging him for one, dropping down to 28. And wanting to attack, of course, he's going to tap it down with the Icy. Also attacking with the Royal this time. And passing turn. Keeping my lance open because I want to draw a card on end step. Ping and draw a card. It's not too bad to do at somebody's end step. And what is Dion actually going to do? Hasn't done much in the last few turns. Just past turn. Found that mountain the previous turn. I wonder what's in his hand. He knows that if he taps out, he has to take damage from the Sengir. So maybe that's the reason. Maybe he has a couple of cards that are six mana. And he doesn't want to play that out yet. Yes, I'm drawing a card and pinging him for once. He's going to drop to 26 and he's just passing turn. Attacking, tapping down my Sengir. Attacking him for one with the Royal. Paying two, playing an anime dead on the Fizuvan Doubleganger. That is pretty sweet. That means some more pressure on the board here. And I'm cloning the Sengir again. Remember, it's a 3-4 because Anime Dead gives a minus 1, minus 0 oh to the creature that it animates. It's a small price to pay for such a fantastic card. And I wonder what he's going to do next. Paying two. Oh, interesting. Playing an Earthquake for one. That means I'm going to lose both of my ground creatures. At least being able to ping for one. That is a pretty good move. Paying three. Taking a damage from his own city. Playing his own Royal Assassin. <laughs> oh, this is such an interesting game. Now, um, I actually forgot to clone... The Royal Assassin. Oh, an Oubliette! That Oubliette is so important right now because having an Icy and a Royal against you, but that Oubliette is saving the day for me. Attacking here, of course, he's tapping one down, taking three damage, dropping to 19. And I think the difference here, you see, is that in game number two, I have answers to the threats of Dion and I couldn't find them in game number one. And Dion, of course, has less threats. He had a few turns where he just had to pass... I see a transmute artifact in hand there, but of course he doesn't want to sack his icy manipulator to his transmute. Or perhaps, no, he doesn't have a Nevenerals disc, because that, that would have been a nice option, sacking his icy, getting a Nevenerals disc on the board, and then next turn using it. But he doesn't have that. Paying six, mirror universe, oh man. That is making this really tricky. I need to get rid of that mirror. I can, of course, attack him for seven. He's going to drop to 11, but then he's probably going to switch life totals. Yeah, I'm reading it again now just to make sure that I know when he's allowed to activate it. So mirror universe, you can only use that during the upkeep. So next turn during the upkeep, he could use it. Paying four to draw a card, trying to get some more information. And actually the fact that you can only use it in upkeep is very relevant for me because not just because he cannot use it now straight away but also because i can attack try to kill him in one go so try to deal 18 damage at once and then he cannot use his mirror universe in response he has to wait until his upkeep of course the thing is he's stepped out now but if i attack him now he's going to drop to 11 next turn he's going to simply change life totals and i will be on 11. Or should I think, okay, I just want to force him to use the mirror universe and get it over with. That could also be another option. 
Would be interesting now to have a look at my hand and see what my cards are, because that of course makes a huge impact on the decision to play aggressive or for example, just use the small book that I've cast now as well and draw a card and discard a card, you know, looking for answers to deal with that mirror universe. Looks like I'm deciding to do nothing, which is usually a bad decision. So all I've really done is just drew an extra card and passed turn here. And he's tapping six. Well, we see another big creature, maybe a Shivan. Oh, we see Sword of the Ages. And I believe the sword comes into play tapped. What I do know for sure is that you cannot activate the sword, sword of the Ages. So end step, I'm using my little book, drawing a card and discarding a card, discarding Mana Flare here, probably thinking it would help my opponent more than it would help me. It's always a bit risky, the Mana Flare. Playing a Soul Ring. Tapping six, playing a Mahamoti Jin. Wow, look at that army. So what I'm basically trying to do now is I'm trying to put as many threats on the table so I can kill Dion in one swing. And I'm sure Dion realizes this as well. I mean, he has his Icy Manipulator so he can tap down my Mahamoti. Then he still takes seven, goes to 11. And if I then have a Fireball or Disintegrate or something, um, you know, I can... Can I kill him then? No, because I don't have enough lands because I've got eight lands nine lands so that's not enough so i still need to put more threats on the table but of course dion is not sitting still as well there is said tetsuo this is another big problem for me because tetsuo he can pay and tap and he can kill a tapped creature or a blocking creature of course it has summoning sickness now still but this is not an ideal scenario for me So just, yeah, this is really difficult. The Mirror Universe has really changed this game. I thought I was winning and then the Mirror Universe came and there was a turn that I did nothing. Perhaps I, I should have just attacked with, with what I had, just deal seven damage, drop into 11, kind of forcing him to use this as universe. Uh, but anyway, I decided not to. I decided to try to draw some more cards, get some more information. But now, I mean, it's not looking great. Remember, the artifact with all the glare on is an icy manipulator. I can, of course, copy the Tetsuo, I guess. This is hard, of course, when you look back at these matches because I don't remember what I actually did here right now. And I, I am pointing it out, but maybe I'm pointing out that I forgot to copy the Tetsuo. And there is a Barrel's Cage. So that's another interesting card that of course we saw in game one being very, uh, very helpful for me. There is a Relic Barrier. So I could start tapping down his Icy Manipulator with my Relic Barrier. This is getting really interesting. He's using his Icy Manipulator, tapping down my Vesuvan Double Gang, and now he can kill the Vesuvan with his Tetsuo, but I can then use my Barrel's Cage to keep the Tetsuo locked up. Very interesting game, very interesting game, and uh, it's far from over. For a moment there, I thought it would be a quick victory for me after that Ashes to Ashes. Tapping three, yeah, using his Tetsuo here to kill my Vesuvan, that probably means that I'm gonna use my Barrel's Cage I have enough land. Remember, the copy artifact is also uh, that mana rock the Felwer Stone. Or am I going to choose to draw a card from GM Day Tome and then in my main phase, I'm going to use Barrel's Cage. That's probably a better approach. No, it looks like I'm using the Barrel's Cage on Tetsuo. Untapping everything. So I'm not using Relic Barrier on the Icy. Ah, that is a missed opportunity here. I could have used Relic Barrier on the Icy to keep it tapped and then I could deal some more damage. I should deal nine damage and maybe I have something in hand to finish it. So this is definitely 
a misplay, although I don't know what I have in hand, of course. So there's Solkanar. So I guess I wanted to play Solkanar to Swamp King first. Now pass turn and possibly finish it. I can deal 14 damage. And if I have a burn spell in hand, like a bolt or something, I can finish it. If I have it in hand, of course. But for now, it looks like I'm passing turn. Let's see what Dion is going to do. Is he going to use his mirror universe, for example? Because that would change the entire situation. Of course, he knows that then I would start playing very aggressively. It's very interesting. Looks like just going through his hand a couple of times, really in the tank here, thinking, what can I do? Should I activate my universe? Put myself here on 28. Looks like he wants to do something on my end step here. So I've already passed turn and he's saying in my in your end step, he's using the shatter on my barrel's cage. And um, that means he really values the Tetsuo. Or he has, of course, other reasons for playing his Shatter now. Taking a damage using his Icy. This is getting interesting. He's gonna, is he gonna tap something down here? Tapping down my Soul Canar. Untapping everything. Remember, in upkeep, he has to decide if he wants to use the Mirror Universe or not. So then he has to do it now, because it looks like he's trying to damage himself, maybe, with that city. Just wanting to take the damage, trying to get himself low enough to switch life totals. Maybe he has some plans up his sleeve as well. Remember, he has a sort of the Aegis which he can use, but he only has one creature in play right now, which is the Tetsuo, which has three power, so it's good for three damage. Maybe it could matter. Looking at his hand... And what's in there? I believe I see a recall. And that would kind of explain the fact why he needs so much time in the tank. Because with a recall, you have, of course, the cards in your graveyard to your disposal as well. I think I saw a time twister also. Time twister, of course, being very risky. But it could be an interesting play also. I'm not sure if it's a time twister, by the way. Maybe it's me just being a wishful thinker. I just really like that card and I just like what it does. You know, everybody gets a new new hand. And uh, so many opportunities always and so many interesting gameplays come after a time twister. There is a basic island. What is he going to do here? Tapping to blue. Casting Transmute Artifact on his IC Manipulator. Very interesting. He, I mean, he does this for a reason. He, he's not just going to sacrifice his IC for nothing. Now, now I'm getting a little nervous. Like, what? Question, of course, is also, is he going to activate his IC before he sacrifices it? He knows probably that his IC is not as powerful anymore because of that Relic Barrier. going through his deck. Interesting, in game one we saw that we both played Nicol Bolas out a few times, and in this game we're both not playing him out. Because I'm now thinking, you know, Dion can also play Nicol Bolas, and that is seven extra damage with his Sword of the Ages. Instead, okay. He's finding Force Field again. So that is a big problem for me here, actually, Force Field. That is a bigger problem than IC Manipulator. So that is a pretty good decision here from Dion. And here we see a picture of the card Force Field. So three to cast, one to activate, and you only lose one life to an unblocked creature. In the meanwhile, I've taken my turn to draw an extra card with the JM Day Tome. Playing a Badlands. And I just kind of feel that this is going to be a very decisive turn for me. Also with the Tetsuo still tapped. And what am I going to do? I mean, this force field again has changed everything. I mean, 
I can attack, but he can simply make all my creatures small. Or, or he can take the damage, meaning he wants to use his mirror universe. And tapping one red, one blue, and soul ring. What am I going to do? Actually deciding to untap it again. I'm, I'm a little bit in a tank now as well. It's, it's really an interesting game. There are just so many options and so many factors to, to count in here when deciding your next move. I kind of feel that I can take the victory here. But, I mean, it's, it's not coming easy. And if I make a mistake, maybe I'll lose. Even the smallest mistake. Okay, I'm going to use both of my books here, trying to dig for answers before deciding to do anything else. That means I'm drawing a card after that. I'm drawing a card and I have to discard a card. My graveyard's pretty full. And it's hard to see what I discarded there. And it looks like I'm passing turn here and he's using a City of Breast for nothing just to take the damage. That's an indicator that he's planning towards using his Mirror Universe. But he wants to get his life total really, really low before he does that. And maybe then use the Sword of the Ages with Tetsuo to finish it. That could be a scenario. I think that Force Field was a really good play by, by Dion. Such a strong card in this situation where I just have a lot of creatures. And yeah, I can now clearly see a Recall and a Time Twister in hand and another blue card. Couldn't identify that one in Dion's hand. But he does have tons and tons of options. I'm wondering if I'm going to cast... Or if he's going to cast Nicol Bolas, because he can use that in combination with his sword. He could even deal damage to himself, of course, if that's what he wants, and then switch life totals. He has enough mana to cast Bolas, but then he would be tapped out, so that probably wouldn't be a good idea, because he would take so much damage from my creatures here. That would mean 14 damage. He, would, he wouldn't be dead. He would still be on one life. He can then switch life totals, but it's super risky because if I have just the smallest burn spell, I could win the game. So it's probably not a good idea to cast Bolas right now. Looking at his hand again. What can he do? Paying three here. That means he's taking another damage. Okay, I guess he's not. Untapping again. Wow, this is... Uh, <laughs> this is some serious magic here. And it looks like he's passing turn, so end step using the Relic Bearer just on the sword. At least then he cannot use that anymore as an... Uh, as an instant. I'm sorry, I meant to say fast effect. Anyway, using the little book here, discarding, I think that was a land, but it went by pretty quickly. Anyway, drawing a card, discarding a card. What else am I going to do? It's really difficult to play against these cards, I can tell you. Mirror Universe, Tetsuo, Sword of the Ages, they're really tricky cards to play against. And okay, why not just play another big creature? I guess that's my uh, strategy. Playing a Sheevan Dragon. And he's taking a damage. Ooh, interesting. Playing a Psionic Blast. And he's playing it on himself. So that means he takes two damage for the Psionic Blast and four damage for himself. So he's probably going to use his Mirror Universe right now. Is he going to use? He has to do it in upkeep. Is he going to use it? He's going to use it. That means I'm going to drop to eight. He's going, to draw, he's going to go up to 28, so I knew that this would happen. I think in hindsight, I should have just attacked and forced him to use his Mirror Universe way, way earlier in the game. Because I'm giving just giving him so much opportunity. He's using a Sword of the Ages on his Tetsuo, dealing 3 damage to me. That means I'm going to drop to 5 here. I'm sure he wants to kill me. What else is he going to do? 
He has that recall in hand. He can simply recall Earthquake. Does he have enough mana for that? He does. He can recall Earthquake and then I'm dead. Then I'm dead. But if I have something to gain life or counter Earthquake or do something against it, then, then he's probably dead. Because I've got so many creatures and he has to tap out to do it. Like he, Then he cannot use his force field anymore. And I've got 15, 19 damage plus... Well, he wouldn't be dead actually. But it would be really, really bad. But wow, wow. And is Dion going to take the risk? Is he going to do it? I'm on 5, he's on 28, he's got a recall in hand, so what I'm saying is he could pay 2 blue to recall. Of course he has to pay X. So 2 blue and 1, discard, discard a card with the recall to get his... Let's see what he's going to do to get his Earthquake back. Or is he going to cast a Time Twister? So he's got 2 cards in hand, recall and Time Twister. I'm on 5 life. He wants to win this now. He's playing Recall, discarding the Time Twister, playing Earthquake. And what am I going to do here? Can I survive? Can I find a way? Oh, playing a Terror! Oh, oh man. So Terror, just to explain what's happening here, Terror is a black spell. And because of Solkanar, I gain one life whenever any player casts a black spell so I'm going from five to six and he's playing an earthquake for exactly five so now he's on 22 I'm on one he's completely tapped out wow he has no cards in hand anymore so basically I just need to kill him next turn because I'm still on one He's on 22, he has no lands, he has, you know, all his lands are tapped, he has no lands to, to, or mana to use his force field. He has no cards in hand. So he's passing turn here. Oh man, this is just ridiculous. Is this terror on my own Ma Multi Jin going to give me the game? I'm attacking now with everything I have. Gonna drop 14, then fireball, that's it, that's game. Oh, -ho! Oh man, oh man, and I think I had Fireball in hand for a very long time in this matchup and I was constantly counting and trying to figure out what to do and you can see here Dion stretching out his, his hand, great, a very uh, great sportsmanship. Uh, but of course because of the, the COVID, uh, we decided to box instead, which I guess is not the best idea as well. Anyway, um, very, very exciting match. Oh man. What a game this was, and uh, it was it was one big puzzle. And I mean, I apologize if this game went too slow from time to time, but you have to understand there were just so many factors to kind of um, take in when making a decision when deciding your next play. For me, I could really kind of smell the possibility to win this game number two, knowing I play against such a strong, beautiful deck. I really wanted to to try to get this victory. Um, it is it is game two, it's 1-1, one, one, so you're probably thinking there's going to be a game three. Unfortunately, um, there was no time anymore, so we couldn't play game number three, so we're stuck at 1-1. One, one. Let me know in the comments below if you would like us to play game number three, because then we're going to try to arrange another meetup. As you understand, under circumstances, it is difficult to do, but, you know, as long as you, uh, you keep your distance, it is it is possible so anyway let me know in the comments below if you want us to play another game if you want us to play game number three and if you want to see that here on the channel uh thank you very much for watching another episode of timmy talks the channel where we talk old school magic oh man what a match and if you want to support the channel um you've already done it by watching the video you can also do it by liking subscribing subscribing uh leaving a message that helps as well leaving a comment and um what you can also do is you can sponsor the show financially so you can become a sponsor by uh, joining patreon and then you become a patron of the show and how does that work well there's probably a link popping up right now click on that link 
and that will take you to Timmy Talks Patreon page, and there you can see how you can support Timmy Talks. And I can, I, you can already start from one dollar. So I would appreciate it if you would take a look and just consider it. Um, there's also a link to the Patreon page in the description below. Thank you for watching and uh, talking about Patreon. Let's take a look to my. Uh, let's take a look. Whew, let's take a look to the end scroll where we see all my fantastic, amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het als fikker te samba kan zien.